is let's go to desktop now i'm working in a linux environment so things look a little bit weird and controls are not as fun as a windows system but the good thing is it works just fine It usually doesn't take this much time. So for some reason, Wine was updating. That's fine by me. So this is Kyle Microvision interface. It's not super advanced. It looks like it's from 90s and I can tell you it was still the same just about 10 years ago. Um, I'm not gonna do a full detailed dive of this, but here's what I'm gonna do. So first thing you probably wanna do is to, is probably want to open a project. My personal preference is to go and open one of the examples, usually Blinky. Now, why Blinky? Let's start with this. We've just mentioned that we don't have printf, or at least you've gotta do some sort of a setup to be able to get the printf working. So the hello world equivalent of most embedded systems is the Blinky program, because the easiest thing that you can control are LEDs. And let me tell you, and you will hopefully find out soon enough that LEDs are great for debugging as well. You would be surprised, you would be amazed how much you can get done by just checking a couple of booleans. Uh, so hopefully this course will actually improve your debugging skills to the most as well. You will become hopefully one of those uh, programmers where, who can debug just with printfs or, or just with a couple of if-else blocks rather than using convoluted debuggers and, 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 watch, uh, and watch windows and, and stuff. So Blinky project is usually my favorite because it is simple and it's the hello world equivalent. And it also turns out that I've already <laughs> made a lot of modifications to the, to the uh, Blinky program, but that doesn't matter. What you're gonna see here, one thing that I'm gonna not take your notice is the structure of an embedded program. The structure of an embedded program is very similar to your usual. There is usually a void main, which your compile uh, uses to to, to, to start the, the, the beginning of the instruction memory. Because this is a bit of a C99 variant, you have to define your variables in the beginning. So there's that. And then you can have some other functions with prototypes defined above. And then forget about this line. Here's the interesting thing. It says P1 equals J. So J is just a counter. And then there's a wait function. And then P1 equals J as well. And there's a wait function inside the loop. I'm not going to go into details of this too much. But let's revert this program to its original. Instead of wait 2, forget about wait 2. To make the PC wait, we have an empty function. Apart from that, my two favorite you can see my two favorite pre-compiler uh, macro definitions set bit and clear bits these are great because you're going to be dealing with uh dealing with uh, registers and uh, bits a lot apart from that you can see that we don't have standard io included we don't have any other things included because surprise surprise we don't have those libraries what we do have is a reg51.h file a header file that is able to that's defines the special registers that allow us to control the peripherals the ones that we talked about with their addresses so for example we have an ie register we have an we have an s bit ie3 which is ie hat3 this is a special definition that you did not see or use in uh, in in standard c99 this allows me to define a bit variable. This is special. But apart from that, 
you will also see that P1 is a special register. It's a variable that I did not define. And apart from that, along the other places that I told you not to look, you can look now, we have other registers like T mode, T80, TL0, TCON, TF0. All of these things are defined in reg51.h. All of these are pretty much defined in here. Again, with a special syntax called SFR, you define a register and you write it address. So what's really happening here is that it's almost like we define a pointer, a byte pointer, and we tell that it's this, this pointer's address, this, it's, it points to 0x80. But of course, if I use this syntax, later on when I try to access P0, I would have to dereference it. This is all you know, unnecessary. Instead, Kyle, Kyle's C51 compiler has a special syntax and that already defines all these special function registers for you. And on top of that, it also defines, have definitions, for special bits as well. And so on and so on and so on. Right, so you have your program. What should we do next? Well, we've got to deal with some of the uh, options. Like I said, there are a lot of 8051 variants and we are not compiling for an operating system, right? So for example, when you're calling GCC, for your local machine, what it really does is that it compiles it for your operating system and for your processor. Now here, we don't have a, 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 an operating system and we're not going to be compiling it for our processor, which is an Intel whatever processor I have in this PC right now. No, we want to cross compile. We are going to compile it for an 8051. And we've got to be very specific about the 8051 that we want. That's the thing. So we run, when we go to the options for targets, first thing that you should probably play around is to find your 8051 variant. As you can see, there are tons of 8051 variants. The ones that you're seeing right now is just from Texas Instruments. Let's see. There is Dallas Semiconductor 8051s, right? There is Intel 8051s, and the list goes on and goes on and goes on. You can see that NXP has its own 8051s. So you, you need to find your exact device, exact processor for cross compilation. This process actually applies for whenever you want to cross compile, but for general purpose systems, the architectures are a little, little bit more, um, a little bit more limited, you know. Nowadays, the most general purpose uh, architectures that you have are uh, x86, AMD64, maybe i386 and i686. And a lot of these things are actually compatible between each other as well. But anyways, the thing that you need to do is because we're going to be compiling for a simulator, which is as dumb as it goes, we're going to pick an, a generic 8051, which, uh, in which it says all variants. And on the next side, you can also see what it has. It's an 8051 based microcontroller with 32 IO lines. This means it has 32 pins. It has 32 digital inputs and outputs that you can control. It has internally two timers and counters. You should remember what timers and counters are from 223. So guess what? You have your own timers and counters. You don't have to do software for, you don't have to deal with software for doing timers and counters. You can control these timers and counters from within your microcontroller. It will have its own registers that you can write to program these things. It has five interrupts with two different priority levels. We will talk about those things, but that just basically means that hopefully in operating systems, you've seen that you can have interrupts that, uh, well, that interrupt the execution cycle and then make the program jump to another location. 
it has four kilobytes of ROM and 120 bytes of on-chip RAM. Uh, to be honest, your simulator has 256 bytes of on-chip RAM, but well, we don't necessarily have that within this uh, compiler, so we're gonna go with the lower one for compatibility. So that's what you choose. So related to the question that you see, you, you asked, uh, does the compiler decide which data goes where? Yes, it does. But you can also tell the compiler how to behave. So for example, you can choose the memory model. You can say that small, you, should, you should choose the, the memory model as small and you, can, you should tell it to, or to put variables in data. Code ROM size. You also say uh, choose small program 2K or less. Uh, you can also say actually compact like 2K function 64K program. This isn't going to matter too much because we're going to using we're going to be using the simulator, and of course operating system should be almost always none. We're going to talk about RTX 51. That is not a general purpose operating system. It does not provide the functions or the functionalities that a general purpose operating system provides. This XTOL frequency doesn't matter, um, but in order to uh, make things good, uh, com make things compatible, you should put in here whatever crystal frequency, whatever clock frequency that you expect to use in your simulator. So let me put it this way. So for example, if you're planning to use 11.05 blah, blah, blah as your system clock frequency, it's probably a good idea to put that. Okay. There as well. I don't know what exactly, where exactly this is used, but it's probably a good idea. Uh, output, you don't care. Listing, you don't care. User, you don't care. C51, you don't care. A51, BL51. You don't care. A51 is the assembler, by the way. Since you're not going to be writing in assembly, you don't care. Debug. Well, you don't really much care, but it's probably good if you choose use simulator here uh, so that if you feel like simulating the program inside Kyle, you can do that. Right, so you press OK. And inside the project, what you do is you try to build the target. So, zero errors, one warnings. Warning is uncalled segment ignored for overlay process. Segment is PR wait to blinky. Basically, compiler is telling me that my wait to function is never called, which is not a problem, but for the simulation purposes, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be using wait to, and then this time it's going to tell me that my wait function is not used. That's fine. Uh, there's one more thing that I forgot to mention, actually. Funny enough, this is the most important thing. In the output segment, you need to check create hex file, and the hex format is going to be hex 80. So as an output, you will have a blinky.hex. So what are we going to do with that hex? Before we go in there, I'm just going to quickly show you that... Uh, that you can start a simulator inside the Kyle, but it's not going to be real time. So let's see. One thing, you can only run the simulator, the Kyle simulator with a code size limit of 2K, but you shouldn't really, you should be careful about how much memory space you waste anyways. So you can start your, you can start your code here and then you know, even though it doesn't show it, it's, um, well, it's actually running right now. No. And the Kyle will allow you to actually look at certain, uh, ah, there we go, peripherals, IO ports, it will allow you to observe a couple of ports. But the thing is, right, so it's running right now, but 
it's not real time. It's not going to update until you pause the program. So there is even a logic analyzer here and you can put Like you can even see the signal in here, but it will only update after you run it for a while. So it's, it doesn't show you what's happening inside the microcontroller real time. Sure, it can be quite so useful, especially because you know the printfs could be translated, could be interpreted in here. But in reality, In reality, you just gotta wait until this, this fulfills its thing. So for tiny programs, for small programs that doesn't use IO or external real-time events, it's not going to make a lot of sense. Instead, and this is the reason why I choose to use Edison 51, it is a better idea to use the hex file and to use it on a fully fledged microcontroller. So here's what we do. We click load, and then we're, not, we're gonna have to locate our uh, hex file. So because I use Play on Linux, it is inside the Play on Linux's virtual drives. Microvision 5 is my drive name. Couple C51 examples, Blinky. And there is my recently compiled Blinky.hex file. Hex format is, um, hex file is just a, binary code, but written in hex format. It's nothing really special, but this is what the Edson 51 takes in. So that's what we're gonna use. And you can even see the assembly uh, that, is that is the comp compilation output of your program as well. And then next thing you can do is you can run it. Boom. So this one is updating P1, right? So apparently P1 is connected to LEDs and you can see here that right now my LED zero is turned off. You can also see that I've chosen a clock frequency of 11.0592 with no special reason. And you can see that my update frequency is 100. And you can also see the simulated time of my uh, of my microcontroller here as well. And you can see that we're actually moving quite so slow. It's almost like one millisecond for every two seconds. This is good if I want to observe the memory. So this, uh, this should answer your question from the break as well. You see that I can see the memory moving, but if I actually want to observe it even a little bit slower, whoops, not that much. Okay. I can even slow it down even more. And you can see that it slowed down a lot. But the thing is, this program needs speed for me for, um, to make sense to me. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm actually gonna use a lot bigger update frequency, and then I will hope to observe, to, to finally change in the, in the LEDs as well. And to be honest with you, it's still not enough. So let's increase this, double the speed. Uh, let's just do it a little bit more. Okay, well, I would argue that my weight function is making it weight too much. So one thing that I can do is to use the other weight function that weights much less and compile it again. No. Load the hex file again and run it again. So now you can see the LED switching if, you, if you're looking at my cursor or alternatively, you can see in real time in here that port one, the digital outputs are changing like that. You can observe that, right? 
But uh, apart from that, let's talk about those other pair fills. So what do you have? You have two timers, a serial port, and a couple of other things as well. On top of these things, Edsim 51 provides you with a bunch of external simulated components. You have switches, you have LEDs, you have a digital to analog converter, which to be honest, a little bit useless, but it's there. You have a serial port terminal. So I told you I have a terminal device, which you can later use, which you can later use for printf. You have an LCD, which is a little bit more reliable than the serial port that is here. You have an analog to digital converter. You have a motor controller, which probably that which we, which we were probably not going to use. You also have four seven segment displays, which can be controlled with your GPIO pins as well. Now, all of this, the circuit schematic is you can find it under the button I, sorry, under the button DI. Whoops. Because this is a dynamic interface program, you can actually change the wirings of things as well. And then you can find the circuit schematic under LD, I guess. Yeah. Right. Can everyone see that? So this is your full circuit schematic now. Your 8051, it's 32 pins you can see here and their connections to those external devices. On top of that, the left hand side of the Edison 51 gives you a good view of the special function registers that allow you to control, say for example, your timers and your general purpose registers and other things as well. So for example, your timers, you will learn soon in the second lab, are controlled by TH0, TL0, and TH1 and TL1, and TMOD and TCOM. Your serial port is controlled by SBUF, RXD, TXD, and SCON registers. Apart from that, you have eight general purpose registers that is used by your compiler for various computations. So I can probably imagine that one of these things is your counter variable I, and you have on top of that a couple of other registers, some special functions, some general purpose. Accumulator and B are used for arithmetic and logic operations. Uh, PSW, I'm not entirely sure to be honest with you. IP, again, I'm not entirely sure. IE is interrupt enable register. PCON is power control. DPH, DPL, I can't remember. SP is the stack pointer. PC, you can even see your program counter here as well. Uh, and on top of that, you can in fact observe whatever memory location you want to inside the, the memory map, or you can just write in an address to this place as well. So for example, 0x80, which it immediately understood that I'm trying to look at P0. And you can also see pins here as well. On top of that, you can also change the, uh, the data while it's running as well. So for example, there's nothing stopping me from, uh, actually there is. Okay, so I can't immediately write into the GPIO pins, but I can connect the switch to them and change them. You can see that if I press two in here, you can also see that this guy changes. Apart from that, this program is written in Java and every once in a while, unfortunately, it crashes like it did right now. But it's not the end of the world. So, any questions about Kyle Microvision and Edson 51? Anyone? Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do next. Just as an example, this will be part of your second lab, to be honest. Just 
the Hello World project as well. Just as an introduction to tell you what I meant by a certain serial port setup is needed. So for a serial port setup, you will need to, to, to be able to make printf work. You will need to you will need to set up the serial port because that's what printf works. If you look at the standard io.h, well, honestly, it won't give you the... Yeah, no, it won't give you the actual code for printf, but I can assure you that you need to set up the serial port in a way so that you can use it. So I'm going to Good compile job. this program. Right now, yep. screen share doesn't... Yeah, you're not screen sharing if you are doing that. Thank you very much. Yep. Right, so I've opened another project. This time it's the Hello World project. Uh, again, this is modified. Your Hello World will be quite much simpler. Printf works just as usual. And to be able to make printf work, you need to set up the hardware a little bit. So I compiled this and I'm going to work it again. I'm going to run it again. But this time with a different clock frequency because apparently I have chosen 46. And you see that just with an addition of printf, you can see how much code now I have. That's just ridiculous. But anyways, we can run it. And you can see that my print is going to be here. You can also like, you know, grab the whole screen in here as well. Apparently, I've written a simple echo program that just prints back whatever I send it, send it to it. So we're going to talk about these things a little bit later on. But basically, what we have is a standard set of peripherals. A couple of GPIO, a couple of timers, uh, a serial port for communication, and so on. And apparently, this program also lights up a LED and not every once in a while as well. So this is how actually printf really works in, uh, whoops, or it can work, that you need to set up a terminal hardware, a terminal device for it. Okay. So your second level involved actually playing around with a couple of, um, Peripherals as well. 